Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Tim Swanson. Now, some of you have been around for a long time, and you may remember Tim Swanson, but most of you probably don't know Tim Swanson yet, since most of you have recently started listening to it. So Tim has been on this show twice before. But I was just checking before, it's been a long time since he had, was on before. Last time was in June 2015, so almost two and a half years ago. And uh, back then, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm about Bitcoin and, uh, and cryptocurrencies, uh, like today. And it was really hard to find anybody who could speak critically about it and have a, actually be skeptical of this whole thing. And at the same time, understand it. There was plenty of people who said like, oh, it's nonsense, but they didn't actually understand the thing. So Tim was the only guy really we could find for that. So we had him on a bunch of times. Uh, and, and then Tim went to work at R3. He was there, one of the first people, and I recently left. So he's been, he's been kind of one of the most astute and, and critical observers of the industry for a long time. Um, so yeah, th thanks so much for coming on again, Tim. Oh, my pleasure. Good to see you guys again. Yeah, so since since your fame of the past, I think has has probably gotten like drowned a bit in hype and price and noise and all the new stuff going on. Can you share a little bit about your background? Like, how did you originally become interested in Bitcoin and blockchain, and what was your kind of story through that? Sure, the origin story. We're waiting for Stan Lee to to make a movie, a live action movie. This one. Um, so. Uh, I uh, initially heard about Bitcoin uh, July 2020, uh, 2010 uh, when it was on Slashdot, uh, Slashdot.org. Uh, somebody posted, I think it was version 0.3 uh, around that time. Uh, yeah, I believe that's the, the correct uh, change on it. Um, and then I didn't consider it very interesting um, until really fast forward to uh, end of 2012. Um, I had this, I was on a uh, mailing list and got into a debate with a number of people who said, "Oh, you could do you could do other things beyond just payments. Um, you could hash contracts and so you know, all, all these different buzzwords that that eventually became um, you know, the talk of the town in 2013, 2014. Uh, so I ended up mining uh, uh, that fall uh, on Bitcoin, and then I switched over after the halving to uh, to Litecoin, and then I got rid of everything uh, before I moved back to the U.S. in 2013, um, and then. When I moved back out here, uh, it is interesting. I think that we were all like, looking at the rooms. It looks like we're all in the same rooms that we were the last time I spoke with you. So I'm still based here in San Jose. Uh, my wife is a is a chip designer at a at a large semiconductor company that everyone's aware of. But I'm not going to go into. But bottom line, um, when we moved out here, for, primarily for her for her career, um, I was also looking into the cryptocurrency world, and that's uh, that topic. Um, was something that people have written on, but primarily around prices. And I'm never really interested in price action. I know there's plenty of people that are, I guess, uh, paper paper millionaires at this stage. Uh, have fun uh, paying your taxes on that one. Um, anyways, the uh, my my kind of uh, research and uh, discovery process in early 2014 um, led me to writing a book, which then uh, kind of moved me into the space. And then I wrote another book, and then. Uh, I uh, ended up working for a couple companies in this space. So that's a, a quick, quick uh, rundown of, of what I did prior to basically R3. And then I, I left uh, a couple months ago uh, to set up my own advisory company called Post Oak Labs, uh, which basically works with uh, about half, half the clients are enterprise related and the other half are cryptocurrency related uh, projects at this stage. Uh, again, just for people who are unaware, my, my role at R3 was, uh, I was head of market research. So I had a chance to look at around 500 or so different entities. These are companies, startups, uh, universities working on some kind of blockchain thing that they would talk to us about. And I was usually that first first entity within R3 that, that had a chance to speak with them. So I've, I've had a chance to see uh, the good, the bad, and mostly the ugly of this space. And uh, it's good to, good to be back uh, so we could uh, knock some of these out of the park and, and uh find out what, what's real and what's not. So when you were speaking to these startups at R3, I mean, we've actually spoken in that context as well, uh, in, the, so in the context of Stratum. What's like the, the, the most craziest idea you've heard 
uh, you know, out of those 500 or so startups that uh, you talk to? Okay, like craziest so- in, in terms of like absurdity or in terms of like crazy ideas that might actually come to fruition? Uh, yeah, you have a, spe- a spectrum of, of various dimensions. Uh, you have the uh, things that are just outright illegal, um, which are these, uh, not, not even the ICO things, but ways to uh, really make it difficult for you to trace any kind of uh, uh, account. I don't want to say accountability, but you can't trace funds easily. It's actually the opposite of what a, what a blockchain typically is used for, right? Uh, and so that, that, that the key thing that they were trying to sell us on or sell me on was uh, effectively money laundering and tax evasion. So that was pretty good. I won't mention the name of the project, but I uh, actually saw that more than once um, early on. Um, and then some of the other stuff, uh, I mean, if, 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 if the goal for financial institutions to use this tech is to automate processes that are either um, time consuming or costly or, you know, there's uh, breaks in trade or something like that, if the, if the goal is, is to digitize, automate, and then cryptographically prove that that stuff is taking place, then um, the, some of the visions that some of the entrepreneurs had is to effectively replace entire intermediaries and market structures. Again, I'm not saying that will happen, but that's generally like one of the pitches. And I'm sure you guys saw this, especially in, in 2015, during that initial hype curve uh, through Cybos and uh, I guess Money 2020, all, all that stuff that happened at the end of that year. Um, people standing on 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 tables saying blockchains are going to destroy, you know, X Y Z, just fill in the blank, and uh, you know, obviously maybe that could happen, but it certainly did not happen in in that time frame that a lot of those, uh, you know, I don't want to say just consultants, but generally speaking, the the big the big four, you know, trotted out their guys on stage saying this is this is exactly what's going to happen. Early 2016, they they started partnering with with startups and and most of the startups I'm not going to mention names, but failed to really see any traction because um, they simply didn't realize how hard it was to get an enterprise sale. Uh, that sales cycle is uh, it's not only annoying but uh, it's going to be demoralizing because you have to sit there and explain to not just one committee but like 15 different committees. Uh, over a process of a year or two, and then you find out that the software that you built isn't easily reproducible in other institutions. So I'll, I, not not to, to belabor this point, but you, you've had a lot of these really clever, smart entrepreneurs building really useful stuff, and then they bring it into an institution. They they customize stuff around it to make sure it plugs into legacy infrastructure, and then they're like, oh, uh, I guess uh, I'm going to go try and sell this now to this other you know competing bank or whatever it might be, and, th- and then they find out that. They have to recustomize it, and then they have to do the same kind of recustomization along the way for all the all the infrastructure and all these banks. So that's not to say that you shouldn't do it. I don't want to say anyone listening to this show don't be an entrepreneur, but uh, just you know, eyes wide open. It's if it was easy and really quick, uh, you know, get rich quick, as as people like to like to think this space is. Uh, it's it's really not. It's uh, maybe get rich slowly at most, uh, and you're you're gonna have a lot of bumps in the road. So um yeah the enterprise side still going along we could we could talk about that if you guys want in more depth but uh that's just one part of the space versus the you know, the whole cryptocurrency world one thing i'm curious maybe this is a bit of an unusual question like you have this i think kind of unique perspective in having this highly like skeptical outlook on everything and and you know you, you really seem to like not be affected at all when, you know, back in 2013 and 14, there was this same kind of enthusiasm that we have today, right? And, and like, where does that come from? Uh, well, I, I don't see any benefit of being super religious about stuff. Um, again, I'm not saying you shouldn't be excited or passionate about or even enthusiastic about the topic, but we've seen historically uh, lots of manias that go on. We've seen it in tech, especially uh, with, you know, a lot of companies jump into the social media world, solar panels, uh, VR most recently, a- VR and AR world. Um, so and it doesn't, I don't see the benefit of becoming a fanboy of anything um, at this early, early stage. So for me, um, I, number one, wasn't really uh, politically or ideologically motivated um, on any of this stuff. And uh, it's kind of, I guess you could say it's benefit in the sense that uh, I've, I've tried to remain as objective as possible. If people would like to, like the data, like I, I'll give you an example of, for those viewers who hadn't seen what I wrote in the past and why I ended up getting on shows like this, is because I was going out of my way, doing the best I could to actually get uh, 
original source material from like metrics of who is actually using cryptocurrency or something, an application or whatever. Um, and it was it was difficult, but I got I got a lot of good stuff. I guess BitPay uh, was uh, was a company that, that ended up uh, in the crosshairs quite a bit because it, I know it, no one talks about using Bitcoin as a payments today, at least on the the Bitcoin core side, the maximalist that's you know all the digital gold narrative. But back in 2013, 2014, there were people marching in the no, not marching in the streets, but mar marching on social media. You had the Andreas Antonopoulos of the world saying, "Oh, it's going to destroy Western Union." Western Union is very much alive and growing today. All these you know uh, uh, remittance players that are considered you know evil baby eaters by the Bitcoiners are still alive uh, for the for reasons that were different than uh, the network. Everyone keeps on, uh, all, all, all the Bitcoiners like to focus on, oh, there's a double spending problem that needs to be solved. Look, that's not the actual issue that for, for remittances. We have a whole show about that. In fact, I think that you guys should have a guy named Yakov Kofner on. He's a partner over at Gartner. Uh, he runs a website called Save on Send. Uh, he's, I would say, the best uh, expert. Um, he doesn't have particular... Um, uh, allegiance to one entity or the other. He's just a pure researcher. And uh, bottom line is that you have a cost structure around remittance companies, uh, the, the, the the compliance costs, the actual physical entities you need to pay on the ground. So anyways, besides that, uh, going back to the point, uh, I, uh, I'd i like to think that if somebody presented some new data that showed people using stuff, besides you know prices going up, whatever, that's, just, that's just pure speculation at this stage, uh, speculators jumping in on on different coins and stuff like that. So yeah, for me, uh, I'm more interested in, in seeing how people actually use technology rather than just sitting around and, and, and writing the coattails of others who, who might be buying something. And hodling. <laughs> no, but I'm, so I'm going to take a slightly different uh, point of view here. I mean, so you said that there's, there's no real point in being a fanboy. Um, well, you know, if you look at like the technology innovation curve, like that that's the whole that's the whole cycle of that curve, right? That you first have the the innovators and the early adopters until right, the technology comes to it to sort of massive adoption. Of course, um, you know, those of you who have read Crossing the Chasm also know that you have to cross that chasm. Do do you think that we have an opportunity to cross the chasm or is this going to become like in your opinion, will this become the segue? <laughs> you know, put things no. So I mean, when you say it uh, or this, uh, so I just want to be clear for the audience. I I, I look at the the overall uh, within the fintech community, the, uh, the the blockchain world or whatever you know uncountable noun that no one wants to to use. That no one ever uses the A or the before blockchain, right? Everyone just uses it as, as its own noun. Um, uh, I see it split in half: enterprise world and the cryptocurrency world, including all the ICOs. Um, I, I don't want to say either one necessarily would become a segue, but what's ended up happening on the enterprise front is you've had multiple vendors try to build out communities and ecosystems around that. And that's a, a real process that has to be done. There is no shortcut around that. You need an organic, independent community to, to contribute code and applications to it. So that's going to happen no matter what, or it has to happen no matter what. Um, and so, yes, you do need people who are fans, but you don't need to become religious about it. What's happened on the cryptocurrency side is they've effectively, since you know that 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 huge bear bear run into when Gox collapsed all the way up until end of 2015, when all the different uh, you know MMM Global and stuff like that got onto the Chinese exchanges. Um, that that year and a half process in which everything was kind of in the gutter was basically an era of self radicalization. These people like. I'm not saying that you know that you need to have law enforcement go in and, and break up these groups, but bottom line is if you look at the the, the kind of discussions and talk and, and, and verbiage that this, these maximalists uh, that are still around and very very vocal today, they they effectively became their own religion, uh, creating their own religion, uh, which has allowed them to cross that chasm to where we are today in the sense that you have uh, cryptocurrency communities, uh, some much more uh, bullyish than others, I would say, if we're going to put a spectrum of people who actually build stuff versus people who just sit around and, and argue on Twitter, you have, you know, the Ethereum community has been very, very good at uh, rallying um, developers to its cause. You, if you, if we did any, you know, actual metrics uh, to compare, um, you know, growth or usability, I, I'd say, and again, I, I don't own any Ether. I'm not involved in the Ethereum community directly at this stage. I think that they've probably done the best in, in the sense that uh, they've attracted a very diverse group 
of participants. You have the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, which has brought in various enterprises, like around 200 or so different organizations in it. Um, and uh, then you also have the indie developers that want to you know, save whales and stuff like that, which is just fine. But you have a whole spectrum of people. It's not just one group. Whereas if you look at the Bitcoin core on the other side, you know, these 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 are the hard, most hardcore maximalists that, that want to like burn down institutions. And they're probably going to use you know, their newfound millions to try and do that. But I um, they, they have not been inclusive. They've not been interested in in bringing in new blood into the fold. They're very cliquish. And in, this is provable because they document this on social media. <laughs> but they, 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 they post this stuff all the time. So anyways, you have communities in between those two. I was just giving those examples of, of polar opposites. And again, I don't own any cryptocurrencies and I'm not involved in being paid by, you know, shills for XYZ coin or whatever. I, I have had these views are pretty, pretty consistent over the last few years. I definitely want to come back to this in a little bit because you wrote some, I think, very interesting posts around kind of control in these decentralized networks. But maybe first, so the enterprise blockchain space and then this whole, you know, for example, R3, right? There used, there used to be a huge amount of uh, kind of momentum and attention around R3 at one point. There was like new press releases, like constantly and new banks joining and it, it seemed like it was going to take over the world in like no time. At least uh, that, I think that was kind of the, the perception that was generated in the media. And, and now I think we have had a big shift where we have all this ICO money, right? Attention has moved, uh, Kind of back to the public blockchain space, right? Most activities there, are like new startups, they, they, I mean, there's few new startups doing enterprise blockchain stuff. So, how, what do you, how would you characterize like the state of this enterprise blockchain market? Like, how is the progress, how much progress is actually being made, and and on what kind of timeline? Sure. So, if you look at a Gartner hype curve, uh, hype cycle, I, I would say it's kind of in the trough uh, for sure, uh, and how long that trough persists is. Uh, not something I could particularly guess at, but um, yeah, I, I think that the the problem as a whole for the enterprise space is they did not manage um, in any of the expectations. You had some that sat there and, and uh, some of these vendors went out there and, and said that, you know, in six months, we're going to put all the U.S. equities onto a, a blockchain for, you know, for good, and it's going to be done. And that that specific entity was based out here. Uh, they had initials of DT. Uh, I won't go into in, in, into the, the the enterprise, but they didn't get funding because people realized that that's not possible to 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 restructure the U.S. equities market, uh, at least on the infrastructure side. Um, so again, I, going back to my point earlier, I think that um, because you had unmanaged expectations, uh, you had the enthusiasm from at least the retail consumer crowd that was kind of on looking at seeing how this stuff could impact them when they realize that enterprise is a, a long-term build out a long-term cycle and to them it since it's longer than six months they decided hey let's go do something that's a little bit easier you know quick wins for ourselves and in, in, in the metrics that we've defined in that in that case it's in this case it's the the ICO world so just to give comparisons, if you look at say a dozen or so enterprise or startups working on enterprise stuff, so I'll give you examples. Uh, Digital Asset or DAH, uh, by the way, they just had that announcement yesterday with uh, ASX. They're going to go through and build out the uh, the chess, re rebuild the chess platform using a, a blockchain that they're that they've built out. Uh, again, I'm not endorsing companies. I'm just going to list a bunch. Uh, so DAH, uh, Axoni, Symbiant, uh, R3. They're all, all four of those are in New York. Uh, Consensus Enterprise, which is a subsidiary of Consensus, uh, also in New York. Um, and then on the um, in London you have Cobalt DL, Settle S E T L dot I O, uh, Rise Financial, and then Clearmatics. Full disclosure, I'm actually still an advisor to both Clearmatics and R3. Uh, and then on on the West Coast you have companies like Pure Nova, um, Chain. Although I I would wager that Chain moves away from from the enterprise space again. Uh, and then Ripple kind of has well, it does have an enterprise product, but they also rely on consumer. Uh, re retail uh, consumers for the XRP stuff. So anyways, there's about a dozen or so uh, companies and that that list hasn't grown much over the last year, two years. If you look at the funding as an aggregate, those companies have raised maybe $450 million, headcount of a list, maybe a, maybe around a thousand. Uh, so if, like DA has about 135, 
R3 has about 150, uh, and most other companies have uh, much smaller headcount numbers. Um, so it, just for comparison, I mean, it's not, a, it's not an accurate comparison. ICOs in the month of June raised about $600 million. I believe the number was $601 million. Uh, and you had this enormous amount of uh, uh, conference circuit, kind of what we saw uh, at the uh, end of 2015, early 2016 on the enterprise side. But that was just in like one country alone, in China. China alone had over 60 ICOs in the first six months and half a billion dollars was put into it before uh, it was, I think, rightfully cracked down on because of the amount of just pure scams that were taking place out there. So yeah, you, you have uh, a shift in enthusiasm. Uh, and I think that was because you had people who were very short-sighted uh, wanting to get rich very quickly rather than to build out the actual technology. You still have to, even with ICOs, these people that raised 100, 200 million dollars, 300 million, whatever it might be, you can't bypass the, the requirements gathering of, of the institutions or enterprises or your and, and consumer, whoever it is that they actually need. Uh, you can raise as much money as you want. You could pay off as many uh, law firms to help you get out of whatever security situation or whatever regulatory situation it is, but you still need to build something that meets the requirements. Uh, you can't just take an airplane and hope you convert it into a helicopter and sell it to a bunch of helicopter enthusiasts. Uh, maybe, maybe they're going to try and do that and keep it afloat for another six months or a year, but it, ultimately someone's going to have to build something and it's not just platforms. Somebody's going to have to build applications and that's why you need a community. That's why ecosystem building is is so critical for the enterprise space. Uh, and, that's, and that's why you end up uh, really with kind of the consortium model is, is what people have, have, have kind of uh, circled around at this stage. And we can go into that if you want to talk about some of the consortiums out there. Yeah, I would love to go into that, but maybe just one question first. So you said that there was no new, basically, enterprise blockchain companies at this point, and, and it certainly seems like that as, as a little bit more of an outsider to this. Uh, do you think this is because uh, there's just so much of a head start of the ones that have started, and or, or it's just because it's impossible to raise money, or what's the cause of this? Yeah, it's, it's actually a combination of the above. Um, if you are just two dudes with a laptop right now in the Bay Area trying to start up an enterprise infrastructure company, you're not only late to the party, but you're not going to get capital uh, because the end user, the customer infrastructure for financial infrastructure are these large investment banks, insurance companies and regulators. Uh, so if they're, not, if they're not already part of your team or your conversation or you don't have advisors who used to work there or whatever it might be. Um, that's probably done and done uh, on that end. Now, that's not to say that the dozen or so that I just mentioned are the ones that will be victorious. You have large enterprises themselves like Oracle, SAP, IBM, Microsoft who have budgets um, that, uh, and the ca capacity to, to acquire these companies. And just, you know, Oracle, I'm not saying they will do it, but they have the balance sheet to buy all dozen of those companies and, and not really blink much of an eye. Uh, again, that's just a hypothetical. I'm not saying that they will, but yeah, I think uh, you need a, a, a lot of capital. It doesn't to, to build out financial market infrastructure. It's, there's an actual term for, for for viewers who are trying to understand this. I've written a couple of posts about FMI uh, specifically uh, around uh, infrastructure that's used by regulated institutions. There, there's something called PFMI, Principles of Financial Market Infrastructure, uh, and to build against those requirements is costly. It's time time consuming. So I, I don't want to you know, depress anyone from, from joining in that space, but I would, instead of trying to build out more infrastructure, I would look at building some applications on top of the, 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 the platforms that are, that are coming into maturity. So again, I'm not going to uh, go into uh, you know, which ones they should or shouldn't. Uh, that's a whole other conversation, although we can argue about that if you guys want. That's, that always makes for good fun. So I would agree with you that uh, having, um, that it, it would it would in fact be difficult today to start sort of an enterprise uh, uh, blockchain infrastructure startup um, if you don't have those advisors, if you don't have those people in your capital, for instance. I know that in, in our case, it's been extremely valuable to have insurance companies invest in the company and to have those people sitting at the board and being advising the company. However, so I'd like to, I'd like to come back to um, this idea of you know, rolling out this technology in within enterprise, and you know, a, a lot of these startups have been, you know, R three included, have been working on this for um, two, three years, right? Uh, I think Chain was founded now three years ago. Although they, they pivoted to enterprise, maybe maybe like one year within after after being founded, and so far, a lot of enterprise, and I think this is true across the ecosystem. Regardless of you know how many press releases IBM 
puts out uh, um, that for the most for the most part, a lot of this is still at the POC or some sort of you know pilot with multiple companies, like some consortiums are, are experimenting um, at a higher level, and it's it's taking a lot of time to actually get anything done, right, or get anything implemented in production. Why do you think it's taking so long? Even you know, even for companies that have all of this industry experience and this industry advisory and industry investment, why do you think it's taking so long? I mean, I have my ideas, but I'd like to hear yours. Yeah, it's it's a it's a combination of a few things, a few different things. By the way, I, I didn't mean to to leave off uh, Stratum in that list. I was just thinking of three specific cities. So you guys certainly have been the uh, uh, nice little poster boy for for France on the enterprise side. So congrats again on the. Uh, on the momentum you guys have had with that. Um, so with the, uh, why is it taking so long to go from proof of concept to pilot stage? Uh, there's a, a couple different reasons. In fact, if you, if you want to have on your show, I recommend bringing in some guys like uh, Clark Thompson. He, uh, he does some of the, uh, the, the projects over at R3 in New York. Um, and he was the first person to explain, you know, the PFMI stuff to me um, a couple of years ago. Uh, he, or I guess just a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Sorry, um, what's PFMI? It's Principles for Financial Market Infrastructure. It's these list of uh, recommendations for if you're going to build out mission critical infrastructure for regulated financial institutions, what should that look like? And how, how should that, uh, uh, redu- how can you do it such that it reduces risks instead of increased risks? Because this, this was, these were formally formalized uh, after the the financial crisis, uh, so that way to, to help at least on the infrastructure side prevent um, you know basically snowball domino effect kind of uh, problems of, of entire systems going down uh, in case you know contagion took place. Anyways, um, I think that um, just touching legacy infrastructure, uh, you know, these institutions like the DTCC um, or any of these central banks. Uh, that exists, they have infrastructure that they can't just turn off and you can't just put your your code or your network or blockchain, whatever these things you're trying to sell into an institution, um, you can't just turn it on and put everything in production on that. You have to have run things in parallel. Uh, so <laughs> like, just from a capital standpoint to go from that first meeting with an institution like the DTCC or a central bank uh, and then get them to approve a POC or a POC uh, and then have that POC, uh, you know, check all the marks, go through committees to have, you know, them, you know, bring up, highlight other issues to do in a second, you know, version or third phase or fourth phase, then into a pilot and then into a parallel system in production uh, and then into potentially production. Um, that could take multiple years and millions and millions of dollars and you need talent uh, to do that. So I, I think that that is something you can't just uh, ignore, uh, in, 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 or, or, or there's no quick way to move your wave your hand and get rid of that uh, that whole process. So unfortunately, uh, the uh, the community thinks that once you've built a pilot, it's good as gold. But unless it's in production and you're generating revenue from it, uh, the, the institution may not use it. They, to them. They not only want to save money through reducing costs, but they want to be able to generate new revenue through business lines or to, with existing business lines. And if you can't do that, you won't have the support uh, for from the, 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 the actual managers inside. You can get the support from maybe innovation teams, but that only lasts for you know a year or so. I'm sure you guys have seen that. You know, plenty of innovation bank offices or, the, or even insurance companies have their own innovations team. And I'm not saying to, to belittle them, but at some point you have to deliver value that's core to the actual institution. Uh, and unfortunately for, for most of these, uh, these vendors out there, especially at the end of 2015, early 2016, that pivoted into it, um, they did not have a really good idea of how institutions worked. Um, and I won't name names, uh, but if you, if you go to my, uh, I have a blog post, it was called The Great Pivot. Um, for, for those who haven't been to my website, I have a website called Upnumbers, uh, numbers.com, just go type in Great Pivot and you'll see uh, a number of companies, and, and, and I remember at one point, um, Adam Draper from Boost, uh, Boost VC, he's like, yeah, uh, you know, I tell all my portfolio companies to call themselves a blockchain company, not a Bitcoin company, because because banks aren't interested in Bitcoin right now, or something to that effect. 
and like he's he's just creating more noise by that kind of advice because uh, then you have this euphemism everyone called themselves a blockchain company throughout 2016 and so it, it, it made my job actually much harder because i actually had to go listen to every single one of these guys just to make sure that r3 and and uh you know any of the stakeholders inside r3 weren't missing out on some of these companies so i had to listen to all these crazy pitches it even became even crazier uh, because people came desperate when they realized that you know that traction wasn't occurring, they need more money, and then they end up going becoming you know bank consultants or ICO makers or something or, or both. And there's nothing bad about being a consultant to large institutions. There's uh, you know you're still creating valuable things, but at the same time, if if we did a a post mortem on these companies that claim to have built enterprise infrastructure, they, they didn't. They all they did was fork Bitcoin typically and attach some kind of color coin you know mechanism on there and then say hey yeah now you could digitize assets and uh, you guys are able to move your entire uh you know treasury or portfolio whatever whatever you, you had internally that had lots of money on it or in it um they said that this was a solution for it so yeah it was mostly just not even half baked or like quarter baked or you know just ingredients on a table that's that's kind of how most of these startups came uh two years ago so if I can give give my thoughts on why it's 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 been challenging to move forward or why it hasn't sort of picked up as as quickly as sort of we hoped it would have um one of the reasons one of the things we we've observed is uh oftentimes there's especially when dealing with corporate investors uh we have corporate investors there's a disconnect between the venture arm and the business lines so the venture arms are interested in investing in in these companies and uh, with the hopes of being able to bring this technology to uh, to production within the company, and it's sort of a strategic investment for them, and also for us as a, as a startup. But then, when we actually start talking to people in the business lines, they either don't know about it, don't care about it, or um, have some of a some sort of an annoyance that uh, at the fact that like, oh, this you know the VC line is trying to push this technology onto us when like we don't need their help to learn how to do our jobs. So that's one of the impressions that I've gotten is that there's a disconnect between venture and the actual business. And the other, uh, especially de when dealing with large institutions like insurance companies, is just the political. And uh, you know, I don't know if this is different in the U.S. I, I presume it's not, but the 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 political navigating that you have to do in order to get the right people on board. This also creates obviously some 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 problems when wanting to move forward with a project and and i think that in order for any of this to move forward and to go to production what what i'm really seeing is a necessity for um for there to be uh, a homogenous harmonized strategy uh horizontally across the across the company and you know we can look at recent uh, technological evolutions. Yeah. So if you look at say, you know, digital or e-commerce or mobile, um, early on, very similarly, these new technologies are sort of part of it or part of marketing, right. Or they're, they're in one department and they're very compartmentalized and the companies that have come out of that successfully or companies that have crossed that chasm, I guess, in a way, um, are the companies that have, uh, implemented a high level strategy at the at the at the executive level and that um execute that strategy horizontally across all business lines and i don't think that most comp most banks and insurance companies and large institutions are there yet yeah no i i agree with you i don't have any i think you said it perfectly we, we should do a podcast with just uh sebastian show <laughs> and then do an ico all right cool <laughs> Well, let, let's let's move to the the thing that's going to excite everybody, right? Which is this whole. I mean, we are now in the bubbliest time we have been in in this industry since certainly 2013. Although now it's all on a bigger proportion, I would say the. the I think actually the level of enthusiasm, or, or I think it is a little bit more informed right back then there was this like boundless enthusiasm even in, in including ideas like you mentioned it before right the idea that okay bitcoin was going to be used for like payments everywhere and gonna like disrupt western union in a year and stuff like that like now i don't think there's the same kind of uh, insane expectations around bitcoin and some of these things but still right we have uh, an 
just a wave of new people coming in, right, with Coinbase adding, what was it, 150,000 users or something like that a day. And, and I'm sure you guys have the same experiences of all these people, like, asking, hey, I want to buy Bitcoin now. How do I, you know, should I do this? How should I do that? What about IOTA? Like, so many questions about <laughs> oh, IOTA. I get, I get IOTA all the time. <laughs> yeah, which is How many people just want to invest in IOTA? Yeah. So yeah, what's your take on all this? What's what's going on, and what? How does that make you feel? Yeah. So actually, it's it's fine. I'm looking at my phone because my mom sent me a message this way this morning, and she said someone named such and such uh, sent me a text asking me how much money he should invest in Bitcoin. I told him all of it. Not not really, uh, but I gave him your email address. So. People are reaching out to my mom to ask me, or effectively, what what these things are, and that's been happening for you know this whole year because people knew I was involved with this stuff, uh, you know, fairly early on. Uh, number one, I, I if if you were going to take a, a defining moment of speculation and use it as a case study, I think that's truly what's happening. This is not John Bogle. He's the uh, he's a creator of uh, founder of Vanguard Investments. Uh, Vanguard was the one who popularized uh, index funds. Uh, and because people as a whole, as a you, you and I are not particularly good at picking the best performing stock every single year to get outperform the market or at least stay at par of the market. So his his thesis is, hey, what what if I created a uh, index fund that you could invest in that represents, say, the S and P 500? So you invest in there, and that way you don't have to invest in each 500 company, or you didn't have to invest in you know a couple companies that you didn't know much about just so you could stay in, in that performance gain. Uh, and as a whole, if you had done that strategy, uh, invested in companies who, who have equity, who have cash flows, who build products, uh, you would have seen enormous wealth gains uh, since the, the 1970s, since he created Vanguard. And he, he has a good valid point about investment versus speculation. Uh, you have, uh, in, in a given year, I think he says uh, in the US, you have about uh, $250 billion worth of actual investment, either in IPOs or secondary offerings, things like that. Whereas everything else, the, the trillions of dollars of trading that takes place is, is actually speculation. It's just people betting against each other. And uh, he just recently said, hey, uh, related to cryptocurrency, specifically about Bitcoin, he sees this as, as pure speculation. These assets, or if, if you want to call them an asset, don't produce any uh, value uh, themselves. Um, if, and the same criticism goes for for gold and silver and stuff like that. So uh, I think that if, if you're genuinely trying to be an investor, you would try to get equity in companies that are creating value, that there are uh, actual products being built that create utility. If you're tr only trying to get in on speculative mania, then you could buy these things. I, I personally, I, I don't even call them assets. I, uh, I call them uh, network-based bearer coins. I actually have a post coming out about that. And that's because, um, they are bearer instruments in the sense that you need to control the private key. Uh, but I don't think it's fair to call them their own asset class when you could fork it. You can't even fork gold. You can't fork silver. Uh, and I'm not saying that, that uh, this stuff is going to crash or burn. But to to claim an asset is an asset, you have to you have to uh, prevent anything from from removing the scarcity of it. And these things aren't scarce. We've seen. Just this past, you know, couple months, uh, multiple forks of Bitcoin uh, coming out. Uh, it's just easy to 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 clone off. You and I, all three of us, could come up with our own versions of, you know, Litecoin Cash, Litecoin Classic. Yeah, if I may interject there, I, I don't think I. It, I mean, of course, that's true when it comes to the code base, right? Like the software, you can just copy, you can create a new network, right? But then the network effects, you cannot just fork. Right, that is very, very hard. And and even if you have these like Bitcoin forks, like Bitcoin Cash, well, okay, there's some network there, but it's much, much weaker than Bitcoin at this point. Uh, Bitcoin Gold, I don't think anybody cares about. The wallets don't even work. Like not nothing works. Like nobody is really seriously interested in this project. So I, I, I think. And, and as you pointed out earlier, right, the, the, the challenge is building this like ecosystem and community around it, et cetera. And I think that's very hard to fork. So I, I, I'm not sure I see, I agree with your point that this is a major, something that like undermines the value of some of these projects. Sure, but what is the ecosystem of Bitcoin today? Since they're not interested in doing on-chain on payments uh, and they keep on using the trunk card. Oh, level, layer two, layer, layer two is, is 
probably the the best you know sleight of hand that uh, any any developer could have done by selling future utility in something that that, that technically hasn't been built yet. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the whole lightning debate and stuff like that. But bottom line, if if we're looking at utility and stuff that's advertised and marketed for for specific platforms, I, I wrote a paper in May. It's not published, but it was on ICOs. I was trying to explain to uh, internal management or R3 on on why ICOs were important enough to pay attention to in the sense that they'll you know be able to attract talent, making it much more difficult to hire you know, developers and stuff like that on enterprise platforms. Um, but bottom line is if I looked at 20 or so ICOs from 2013, 2014, and uh, looked at some of the the, mark, the, the the marketing material around them and the things that were advertised, and effectively none of them uh, achieved any fraction of, of those goals. Um, maybe they will eventually, but not in the time frame up through, you know, mid 2017, did they have, had, had they done that? Yet the price of each of these coins was basically seeing all-time highs, and I'm sure if we looked at it again today, definitely all-time highs. Um, but so to me, uh, and yet there wasn't like an actual community of developers building stuff. It, there's a complete divorce between the enterprise value of what these networks provide versus the speculative value. Uh, and so, so I'm saying I'm, I'm never going to go on a show and say, hey, it's, it's going to go down to zero or crash to whatever. Uh, there's a there's a separation between uh, those who truly want to invest in platforms that create utility and build communities around that. Uh, and I know that you're, you guys are trying to build uh, communities as well. You're not, you, you never struck me as someone who's uh, pumping Brian coin or something like that. Uh, although I, I, I want to get on your, not, not yet, stuff, not yet. Days. Yeah. You can fool me on that one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, 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 uh, I don't think the price is necessarily a, a good accurate measure of, of the utility of a system you, you have uh, effectively in the last, what, two weeks, the price of Bitcoin has almost doubled from, from under 10k to uh, it's going to be probably 20k in the next couple of days. Again, I'm not endorsing prices or whatever, but my point is, is in that same time frame, you didn't have a doubling of capacity on the network. You didn't have uh, new features on the Bitcoin network at all. Like there's been no new upgrades to it uh, significant in the last couple of weeks. Yet everyone is piling on because they know other people are going to pile on. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's the textbook definition of I don't want to say the greater fool theory, but effectively of uh, a speculative mania where people know that it's going to go up because other people are going to buy into it. So um, I'm again, if we're, if we're looking for for goalposts to measure success of platforms, then I, I don't think that you and I need to come up with new ones. We could just look at our old videos from you know a couple of years ago when we were talking about what would what would be those metrics. It'd be actual users using something for payments. And nobody even discloses payment uh, numbers anymore. Uh, Steam just yesterday announced that they're no longer accepting you know, Bitcoin as, as a payment because of the volatility and fee costs. So, I mean, if, if we look at uh, the same things that we've talked about in, in, in collecting data of, of different companies and, and what they're doing in this space, the only companies that are really successful and that actually do talk about some some numbers are, are the, the exchanges and maybe some of the miners. Uh, but even with the exchanges, you mentioned, I think, the Coinbase number, uh, Sebastian, uh, the, the challenge with that is that those aren't probably actual even users. They're just maybe buying and holding a little bit of cryptocurrency and hoping it goes up. Uh, we, we saw this from, from the IRS lawsuit. The Coinbase was sued a year ago by the IRS saying, hey, you guys claim to have a million users, but we've looked in our records and uh, there's only about 900 people a year who file taxes. So you know, what gives and either you have a lot or you don't, and we need to, we need to check this out. So um, in the suit that they lost, uh, the, you know, Coinbase appealed it, um, but they are going to have to turn over records of 14,155 individuals who traded, I believe at one point it was like, it was either a $20,000 trade or $60,000 trade. It was, uh, it's actually it was not 20,000 over a year, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So but bottom line is if, if you look at the, the quote unquote millions of users they have, Really, the only there's only a small percentage. I think, the, I think Coinbase said 97% of of its users during that time frame between 2013 and 2015 are not at all uh, impacted by this ruling. So, if we look at the numbers that are being added today, you know uh, the hundreds of thousands. Uh, again, my wife and I both have verified accounts at Coinbase. We've never used them, but we're going to be counted towards that number. So it's people trying to get stuff on there. It's still very difficult to move money onto these these platforms. 
uh, and you have limits and stuff like that. So again, I'm not saying that there won't be or that Coinbase won't be successful or or some of these other exchanges won't won't generate revenue. But I think that we have to take the uh, the 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 user numbers not even at face value. You have to dive deeper and see how much of the activity is actually taking place per per user and how much revenue is being generated. So all, all the simple metrics that we have for other enterprises or other companies that are generating revenue, uh, I think can be reapplied to this space too. And it, once the dust settles, once once people uh, stop being manically fear of missing out, uh, I think that, that that those measures will will continue to take place uh, irrespective of, of what the price of Bitcoin may be. Yeah, I mean, I think there's it's a little bit of a differentiation here, right? Where you have some people who are basically trying to build these networks where, you know, they would derive their value from the usage of the network, right? And there's some sort of like, you know, almost almost like a decentralized company, right? Where you, you should basically, basically be able to do some kind of discounted cash flow type thing. You say, okay, we need to have this kind of usage, this kind of fees, and then you can justify this kind of price. Um, and then at the same time, you have something like Bitcoin, right? Which I think is very, very different, right? Because you can't do that kind of analysis there. It's literally just, okay, how much do people want to hold this thing? And yeah, at this point, it's certainly holding more than spending or using it in any other way, but, you know, hold this thing that has certain attributes, like, well, you can control it yourself. Like people can't confiscate it from you. You can sort of send it, even though it's expensive and, and, and somewhat slow, but you can still transfer it. So I think with, with something like that, you, you can't really value it. There's no basis on which to value it properly. And I think what's happening, and so I think in some way you can say, okay, Bitcoin, of course, it hasn't gotten so much more useful, but, uh, you know, as the price has gone up, but it's also, there's no basis for valuing it. I think what, what's kind of crazy though, is when people conflate the two, and they basically value these things that are more like businesses as if they were this asset that doesn't really have a basis for valuing it. And then I think you get these like really crazy prices and, and valuations, especially around ICOs and different coins. Sure. So I guess the two thoughts I had about what you just said, and these are, these are good points, by the way. So thank you for bringing this up. Um, I believe Jesse Powell uh, I recall seeing either interview or an email conversation. I don't think he'll be too angry about uh, mentioning this. This was a couple of years ago. This is actually, I think, at the end of 2013, early 2014, when they had that first big bubble up to uh, uh, a thousand or whatever it was. And he mentioned, he's like, guys, look, uh, you know, I, I put my own sa uh, saving, uh, you know, a trough of Bitcoin into paying developers uh, during this time frame. And, and one of them just re retired. Uh, it was like a, one of his German employees or something like that. Because it'd be, you know, he'd pay them a uh, thousand, you know, bitcoins, and now it's worth a thousand. So the guy's a paper millionaire, uh, and I'm sure it's worth, you know, significantly more today. Obviously, if if that person had held and didn't sell, but um, you you have that conflict, but for for entrepreneurs right now, in in this in in the sense that if they had, instead of actually building something, uh, they could have just bought coins with that money and seen it seen it go up. So why, why bother building that utility? At some point, someone will have to build it and then we will have to be able to, then, then we will be able to measure, um, again, I think using these traditional metrics of, of, of usage. And if you can't meet those, you know, those KPIs, then the valuation obviously is going to change. Um, it, obviously we can jump into that, the ICO, that, that, that froth that took place this year too. But I don't think that there's new economics. I don't think that the old ways of uh, valuing things are, are, are it's it's correct to necessarily throw them out um, and I, and I think there may be way of actually valuing the network um, or at least there's one arguable way uh, Rick Falk uh, Falkbinge uh, the guy who they co-founded the the pirate party I'm not endorsing him or his politics or anything like that uh, but he a, a couple of years ago uh, basically said hey if we if we value the network based on its usage, what is that usage uh, based on what we know? And he was suggesting it's based on the illicit goods uh, dark, dark net market, specifically, I believe, the price of marijuana. Uh, and I'm, again, and, and, and I'm not saying that is the price, but he was saying, you know, at the time, I think the network was a coin was worth like four hundred dollars, and he was like, yeah, as it costs to buy like a a gram of marijuana was like. 20 bucks or something like that. So the network is that. Again, I'm not saying that that is the example to, or the the the, the basis for measuring how much a Bitcoin should be worth. But it, at some stage, uh, once the mania ends, uh, being able to try and value the network based on 
some kind of usage seems like it would be the most proper way of doing it. But again, you know, the markets don't necessarily care what Tim Swanson says, <laughs> how, how, to, how to value it. And I'm sure my the, the tweets after this episode's released will be filling up my, my notifications saying how stupid and backwards and how much of a corporate, you know, baby eating chill I am or something like that. So <laughs> I, I look I look forward to uh, the very creative adjectives people throw my way uh, in the coming months. What excites you about this technology? Like, what are the things that you like want to happen that you think like, oh, this would be so great for the world or this would be so interesting and like so fascinating? Like, what do you want to happen? Sure. So uh, let me let me answer that with a uh, with a question. So Simon Taylor, uh, if you guys don't know, he runs an organization called Eleven uh, FS out in London. Uh, he has a also a, a interesting podcast as, as well. And um, he, he sent me a message actually the other day. It was I have these funny, if you, if you guys think I'm really critical about cryptocurrencies and blockchain, so you should see my movie reviews. I watch, my wife and I watch, uh, you know, movies every other week or so. And I post them um, typically on Facebook or something like that. He's like, Tim, what movie do you actually like? Because I, I, I make fun of movies just in the, in the same way. Like, oh, here's a hole, here's a hole. Um, and so the thing, I guess if, if, he, if he was going to ask me the same question, what, what am I really interested in, uh, in, in, in broadly speaking? I think that uh, on, in the fintech world, it's actually it's things like uh, robo advisors, um, not because I have any stake in Wealthfront or Betterment or something like that, but because it reduces the amount of fees collected by these tolls, these intermediaries. And I think that that's the same thing that, that John Bogle did. John Bogle with the Vanguard and index funds and uh, robo advisors, I think, have done more for the betterment of, to use that, that phrase, uh, of, of humanity um, is, is, is I, I don't think, uh, very arguable. Like, I don't think you could argue against the fact that they've reduced the amount of fees to where um, these entities in the middle, these asset managers, uh, are now um, on the defensive, having to reduce their their, their expense ratios on a you know, monthly or, or yearly basis. Um, if you look at the amount of money that's flooding into ETFs uh, for this very reason, uh, you know, you, you are basically having a race to zero, and that benefits all consumers and all investors because that money is then that would have been spent on expenses uh, goes back into the actual uh, economy, if you will. It's not being extracted by these these third, fourth, fifth, fifth parties. So for me, I am I'm optimistic of being able to reduce the amount of frictions and intermediaries involved in the process of, of handling finance. To give a number, uh, another number. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve published a paper last year on um, the amount of payment clearing and settlement transactions that take place each year. Actually, they, they, it was a distributed ledger paper, but they, they mentioned there was 600 million in the U.S. alone. There's 600 million payment clearing and settlement transactions that take place every single day in the U.S. Uh, worth uh, it was like north of 10 trillion dollars. I think it was like 11 trillion dollars in, in that paper. Um, I'm not saying that what the value should or should not be, but there's a set of bits, you know, a set of of money being extracted from all those transactions, if you could reduce that to as little as possible, then you're you're basically allowing uh, those who are uh, least capable of buying or selling or trading uh, money across you know commerce commercial entities. So uh, I, I don't want to make this a plug for financial inclusion um, because I think that that's been uh, a, very much abused in the fintech circles. You go to all these different events and say, oh. And cryptocurrencies or blockchains are going to sell, you know, financial. I'm sure you, you you've seen it. You could roll your eyes because you've you've heard all these people stand up and say, "Oh, we're going to save people in Africa from you know these transaction fees." Uh, like nobody, number one, really does that. There's one one guy I know uh, in the Philippines, Ron Host, who does do that. Um, again, I'm not endorsing his company, Coins Ph. But he genuinely he could have sat out here in the Bay Area in his cushy office tweeting all day. But he's down on the ground, pounding the pavement, trying to build out actual utility for people who, who don't have uh, um, existing infrastructure that you and I um, enjoy in, in the developed world. So my point with all that is I'm optimistic that uh, despite all the hype and the mania, that when the dust settles, there will be genuine uh, re reduction of frictions and, and, and intermediaries involved that will actually help not just you and I with our reward points or miles on, on our credit card, but uh, would help people who genuinely um, have no other alternative and are being um, you know, basically charge exorbitant fees that, that, that shouldn't be there in the first place. So we, we mentioned earlier that you recently left R3 and that you've now founded a, a new company called Post Oak Labs. Can you tell us about uh, why you found this company and what you're doing? 
Sure. Just a quick thing on the name. Uh, I had a lot of people ask me, what's a post oak? Well, if, if you're not from the southeastern or southern parts of the U.S., there, there, there are trees called post oaks. It's, it's, it's an oak tree. And I literally, when I, when I was uh, leaving, um, I, I was looking for, for names that had, uh, had not been taken. Uh, so I went through a whole list of like, like 200 tree names, uh, looking them up in, in GoDaddy. Uh, to see if uh, see if they were acquired. So the idea with 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 post oak is not so much about the name. Is 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 the idea was how can I take um, the the knowledge and education I received by being at R three in the sense that these all these really clever smart entrepreneurs coming up to us talking to us and informing us of what's going on, and then learning from you know their the hardships that they had to endure, and then basically giving that kind of similar education to clients in the space. So. Uh, as much as I may, you know, make fun of of some of the the participants in the space uh, who were hot headed and said crazy things, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, learning moments that we can have, and I'd like to try and help out those kind of entre entrepreneurs willing to listen to that. Um, so Posto is a, is an advisory company, um, basically providing impactful strategic advice uh, on the fintech world specifically most of my clients right now are um related to doing something related to a blockchain or distributed ledger technology or whatever we're going to call this stuff uh, and about half of those are doing something with a cryptocurrency so as, as much as people think i hate cryptocurrencies i don't i think that most of the 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 use cases and, and the rhetoric around it's complete bs but uh, i still think that you could potentially do something useful with it and so i'm going to help clients with that um and uh, they're global at this stage and um, i don't see that dying down anytime soon. People are very interested in seeing how they could use this type of tech um, for the time being. And I'd like to help out the community as much as I can, make uh, good rational decisions. Um, if I just disappeared and, and, and didn't uh, uh, stick around to help out the, the overall um, entrepreneurial world, then I, I think that that would have been a waste of, uh, of a few years when I was being, again, educated by the School of Hard Knocks, uh, this, this market um, and difficulties of going through the enterprise sales cycles and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a, it's a one entity that I'm working with. Uh, there'll be a uh, announcement with me joining as a partner in another entity um, soon. Um, I'm not going to unfortunately disclose that on, on air right now, but then uh, I'm also working on a, another side project too. It's a consumer facing uh, wellness app. Um, we'll, we'll see if that gets, uh, gets anywhere. It may not. Uh, again, there's a gajillion different types of, uh, phone apps out there, but I, I feel that you could use some of this technology also to, to help out people uh, incentivize um, wellness. But again, not ready to really go into that at this stage. Cool. Well, thanks, thanks so much for coming on and, and thanks for uh, sharing these plans. Now, there was quite a few things actually we wanted to talk about because you, you, you are a man of long blog posts uh, and some of them are very interesting. So we're going to link to them in the show notes. So if people want to check them out, I do recommend that. In particular, there's one which is quite quite interesting about like who are the administrators of blockchain. So it's basically kind of exploring, okay, to what extent are they really decentralized? To what extent is there control by certain groups? And to what extent does that create like legal liabilities, regulatory risks, et cetera? So I think that is actually a very interesting topic, especially I think where it's going to be interesting is is with projects that you know start out in a centralized way mostly, but then they have to decentralize over time, I think, to kind of live up to the promise. And you know, to what extent are they going to be able to do that? Uh, I think that will be very interesting to see. So yeah, thanks so much, Tim, for coming on. Uh, as always, it's been a pleasure. So please keep, keep doing your work, keep publishing your posts, and, uh, and all the best with your new project. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, see you in a few years. Good luck on the moon. Indeed, yes. Where, where you can plant your post oak tree then. <laughs> well, I'll give you some seeds. Well, yeah, thanks so much also for a listener for once again tuning in. We are going to be back next week. And in the meantime, if you want to support the show, you can do so by leaving a, a review for us on iTunes or somewhere else. And yeah, we look forward to being back next week.